Good morning. That's loud, isn't it? I know, right? Good Monday morning. I'm your moderator for today. My name is Regina Waldrop. I thank you. <laughs> Welcome to Laker Leadership Conference 2002. We are so very pleased that you could join us today and be here with us as we discover and connect to our signature opening event. Belief Sparks Action by a man I just met, the great Mel Roberson. This event will prepare and bolster you in your professional and personal success. Now today's format is going to be live streamed and recorded for future use. Hello to our audience at home today. Q&A will be at the end and note cards will be laid out to keep your thoughts tracked. And we would love for you to share your thoughts, inspirations, photos about today using the hashtag Laker Leadership Conference or the QR code. It will populate in a fun photo memory ebook and also share kudos to our speakers on here through LinkedIn. So I told you earlier, I'm Regina Waldrop and I know this school very well. I graduated from here. I'm not gonna tell you the year, not important, not important. I graduated from here a few years ago, but this is where I spent so many days and nights. I was on the student newspaper here called The Torch, and that is where I started my journalism career at this school. And what's so funny about that is that um, I am from the south suburbs, from Harvey. I'm very shy. I'm the youngest girl in a family of eight. And when I told my parents I wanted to be in journalism, they said, you can't even cross the street. You're so shy. But this is the school where I became alive. This is the school where I met people from all over. This is the school where professors believed in me when my parents didn't believe in me. I want to say thank you to Roosevelt University. It is an honor to be here with you today, to be back in this building where it all started for me. The first person in my family to get a bachelor's degree. It happened here. Harvey Proud, and it all happened at this, this school. So I'm not gonna go into any more about me because this really isn't about me. It's about what we can learn from Mel. That's what this is about. So today's presentation is about how your beliefs serve as a great motivator. Oh my gosh, do I ever believe in this? When I wake up in the morning, I tell myself and I tell my daughter, your thoughts become things. Your thoughts become things. So powerful, right? So we're pleased to be able to share this content today thanks to the NBA alumni, alumna, Davina Ware, founder of Upwardly Paved Path Career Coaching. I need some career coaching too. I may talk to her after this. So check her out for two of today's sessions. And we are so grateful for your support. Davina, please, why don't you share a few words, okay? You need the mic? No? Yes. There you go. Just take the mic. Yeah. There we go. Nothing wrong with accepting help. Um, but I got my MBA here back in 2014. Yeah. And it's been a really great experience. So when I saw that we were going to be talking about leadership, I jumped on it because that's one thing that was the foundation laid for me here at Roosevelt is how to become a leader and ultra, ultimately an entrepreneur. So my job is to get as many people on purpose as possible, especially in their careers. So I'll be talking more about that later. But ultimately, I just want you to be thinking, have this in your mind. Think about what your life would look like on purpose. Even traffic, would it be so bad if you're running a little bit late? If you missed a deadline, if you were on purpose, it's the right time and the right thing anyway. All right, thank you. Davina, thank you. And let's dive in right now. Our success or our failure has nothing to do with the opinions of others. Gosh, that's so important, isn't it? I mean, sometimes even, I, you know, I tell my daughter this now, sometimes people in your own family won't believe in you. But your opinions, the opinions of others, they really have nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with what you believe about yourself. Tap into your power through beliefs and actions. 
So Mel Roberson will share insights with you about how people around you may not always understand your goals. That's a big one. People around you, even those closest to you may not understand your goals. Sometimes you may even be a little discouraged, just a little, but through the power of belief, your actions or inactions matter. So much so that your beliefs and actions will spark the power to push through the present to achieve your future dreams. I'm so pleased to introduce our presenter today. Mel Roberson is an accomplished personal and professional development speaker and is a seven time Amazon bestselling author. His writing and speaking style is extremely captivating, specializing in goal setting, personal productivity, leadership, happiness, personal and professional gro growth. I need to meet this guy. Where is he? <laughs> Mel is also a successful SAG actor with several television and movie credits under his belt such as Detective Cullen on Chicago PD. Also, you can watch that on NBC5, shameless plug, yes. <laughs> Mel is a strong professional development trainer with a bachelor's degree focused in political science and government from Quincy University, an MBA from Robert Morris University, and a second MBA. What? In 2020 with a concentration in HR from where? Right here, are you? His most important and rewarding career has been raising his two beautiful daughters. Thank you to my fellow NBC colleague, Mel, for being here with us today. Take it away, Mel. Awesome. Good morning. How y'all doing? How the rest of y'all doing? All right, so, so here's how this works. Can I have the clicker, please? Awesome sauce. I am going to have fun whether you do or not. So I invite you to have fun with me. I am crazy in a good way, I think, maybe. I don't know, ask my significant other, maybe she could tell you that. So I've been charged today to be the opening speaker for this Laker Leadership Conference. And the ability, am I still on? Okay, I'm still on. Leadership is simply the ability to get somebody to do something they wouldn't do had you not been there. That's all leadership is. John Maxwell says it best. Leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. But when we think about leadership and we think about the broad scope of leadership, and everything, sometimes it could be a little bit overwhelming. But the way to eat an elephant is bite by bite. So it's my job in the very beginning of this to focus on your software, right? I could give you the latest MacBook Pro. I could give you the latest iPad or iPhone. By the way, I'm an Apple user, strong Apple user. I could give you any of those things with the latest technology, latest hardware, but if the software or the operating system is not functioning properly, it doesn't matter how well put together the machinery is. So your software is the six inches between your two ears. This space here, this mental space that we'll be talking about, the power of belief, the power of thinking. Regina said it best, thoughts are things, thoughts become things. Anything that you see that is not the physical manifestation of something that God created himself came about because of somebody's thought process. So while we're here this morning, I'm gonna walk you through some things. We're gonna have a good time. Well, I'm gonna have a good time. I don't know what you're gonna do, but I'm gonna have a great time here today. So your diet plan for today. Since I'm, I'm the opening speaker and we're doing breakfast, this is your diet plan for today. We're going to talk about your mental diet. First, we're going to look at the mental muscles that determine success. Success is a habit. Developing muscles is a habit. Anything that you do consistently over a period of time develops that muscle. So we're going to talk about success, how your mental muscles determine success. We're going to do a mental power warm-up exercise. If you've ever been involved in any type of sports, physical activity, or working out, you know that the warm-up is an important part of it, right? You don't just dive right in. We're also going to look at the four competencies. Now, this might be a new concept to some people, but when I explain it, I guarantee you it will make perfect sense. The fear factor, we're going to look at your success ecosystem. What does that look like? We're also going to look at your mental business sickness. Now, when I talk about business, your life is your business. So this doesn't just have to do with your job or if you're an entrepreneur, but your actual life as a business. Anything that I teach always has something to do with how you could be better at work, how you could be better in business, 
But ultimately, success principles, regardless of what they are, usually transcend to the different areas of your life. We're also going to talk about your business immune system, right? If there's a sickness that could happen, well, how do we build your business immune system? And again, business can also translate for life. Best motivators, last but not least, you're going to get homework. We are at my alma mater. It would only be right if I gave you homework today. And we will do a Q&A at the end. So let's start at the beginning. This is me and my two daughters, my amazing, bratty, wonderful, spoiled, rotten. Uh, the, these are the loves of my life. My oldest daughter is the head of wardrobe for 911 on Fox. The Angela Bassett television show, right? She graduated from Columbia. My youngest daughter, she graduated from Glenbrook South High School in 2020. She's now a Division I track athlete at SMU. These are my reasons for anything that I do. So point number one that I want to make to you today, if you have a strong enough why, the how will figure it out. In life and in business and in anything else, your why is the determining factor. If you, the person that knows why to do something will always be more successful than the person that knows how to do something. Anybody in here have children? Children, children? Ma'am, what is your name in the green? Beautiful green. Jennifer. Jennifer. Jennifer, how old are your children? I have one daughter. One daughter who is 15 years old. All right, Jennifer. So let's just say, for the sake of this example, that we are on Regina's yacht down on the Florida Keys, right? She has... Yeah, we're in the Florida Keys, right? Regina invited a group of us out on her 60-foot yacht. We're sailing around. And um, you look over the starboard bow. I don't know which side of the boat that is. I just heard it in like a movie or something. And there's a school of sharks swimming around. Would you jump down there to see what they're doing? I absolutely would not. You would not. But what is your daughter's name? Raina, if Raina fell off the side of the boat, how fast would you be in the water? Before, she, before Raina hits the water, Jennifer will hit the water. Having a strong enough reason why you're doing something will make you do things that are seemingly uncomfortable until you achieve a desired result. It's really what it's about. So if you start that business, or if you start that new relationship, or if you start that new job, if you don't have a strong enough reason why, when adversity presents itself, you'll quit. There's nothing anchoring you there. There's no compelling reason to do it. So I start off with my girls because they are the reason that I do everything. They are the reason that I'm here today to teach you. And we are going to do your how, talk about how your mental muscle determines our success. Now, this concept is a little bit different than what most people are taught. Um, sound and camera guy, I want to get off the stage because I feel too far from people. Is that okay? All right. Will the camera pick me up? Are we on a wide shot here? Good to go. All right. Perfect. Woo. Oh my God. I felt like I was in jail. Jeez. You all sit so far away too, right? So here's the thing. When we look at our lives, when we look at where we are right now, ultimately people are taught to look at their lifestyle or their results. These two kind of go hand in hand. Realistically though, everything is based on philosophies. Now, when I talk about philosophy, I don't mean Socrates or Aristotle, Socrates as they called them in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, if you remember that. I don't know, maybe I'm too old for the people in the room, right? So when they went and met Socrates, uh, but Socrates, right? We're not talking about philosophy like that. When I speak about philosophies, I'm talking about what you know how you hold it, and how you let it affect you. What you know, how you hold it, and how you let it affect you. For example, a philosophy that I adhere to, successful people do what unsuccessful people are not willing to do. That is a philosophy. So let me give you an example, a working example of that philosophy, right? I picked up some COVID weight. I think a lot of us did, right? I'm, I, I was heavier than I had ever been in my entire life. But I knew that I wanted to lose some weight. I knew that my clothes weren't fitting me the way that I wanted them to. My philosophy was successful people do what unsuccessful people are not willing to do. So when the alarm goes off at 5.30 in the morning, if I adhere to that philosophy, I have two decisions. The floor is cold, it's raining outside, I'm not going to the basement to work out or to the gym. Or 
since successful people do what successful people are not willing to do, I'm going to get up, I'm going to work, I'm going to do whatever it, is, whatever it takes to get the desired results. So your philosophies in turn dictate your attitude. Your attitude is how you feel about what you know, right? Now, let's do a little exercise real quick. For those of you that have a pen and paper, write attitude vertically on your paper. A-T-T-I-T-U-D-E. Hope you're getting some good shots, man. I believe in you. I believe in you. Right? Attitude. We are going to do the num numerical equivalent for each of these letters. So A is the what letter of the alphabet? So write a number one next to A. T is the what? Go ahead, use your fingers and toes if you need to. What? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, E, 20. So you got two 20s. What is I? Okay, nine, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. I'm doing this for you, not me. I've done this a million times, right? I, then another 20. And fortunately for you, U comes after T, so you don't have to count. T, U, V, that's 21. <laughs> D is four. And E is five. Add all of those up for me. Add them all up. A hundred. A hundred. Attitude, 100%. It includes everything because attitudes could be good or bad. Right? Every day that you wake up, there are two foremen that go to work. One is negative, one is positive. They go to work in your mind. You decide which one you let win. So your philosophies dictate your attitude. Your philosophies are what you know, how you hold it, how you let it affect you. Your attitude, how you feel about what you know. Your actions, what you do based on how you feel about what you know. What you do based on how you feel about what you know. Those are your actions. Your actions give you your results. I don't have to tell you what those are. And your results ultimately determine your lifestyle. So if your lifestyle is not where you want it to be right now, we can trace it back to most people say, well, my actions, my actions. No. Well, if you got stinking thinking, then your attitude might be the problem. But your attitude is directly impacted by your philosophies. What you think about, you bring about. What you ask for, you get. If you act the way you want to be, soon you will be the way that you act. Your mental muscle, your power of creation is the best thing that the universe has ever given you. You are so much more powerful than you know. I'm going to prove it to you right now. For those of you that are eating or drinking, I need you to stop. If you have water, please clean your palate. We are going to walk you through an exercise right now. All right? I need for everybody to close their eyes for me. Close your eyes. And if, you look, if you're looking at me, that means your eyes are not closed. All right, close your eyes. I want you to picture yourself in complete darkness, like you are floating in outer space. Deep breath in through your nose, out through your mouth. All right, I want you to picture that you are in your kitchen. It does not have to be your current kitchen. It could be your dream kitchen, whatever that looks like. Marble floors, granite countertops, whatever your dream kitchen looks like, I want you to imagine that you are there. Stainless steel refrigerator freezer sub-zero combo. Maybe your cabinets and your refrigerator look alike, so you don't even know the difference between the two. You are in your kitchen. All right, in your mind's eye, I want you to walk over to your refrigerator and I need you to physically reach out and open the refrigerator door. Physically reach out right now and open the refrigerator door. Close your eyes. They just joined us. All right, I want you to grab a lemon out of that produce drawer, lift the lemon to your nose and take a deep whiff of the lemon. 
Now, in your mind's eye, walk over to your cutting board, wherever that is. I want you to grab a knife. I want you to cut that lemon in half, lift it to your nose, and smell it again. The lemon smells stronger right now. In your mind's eye, squeeze that lemon. You can see the pulp rising up. The juice is starting to trickle down your fingers. On the count of three, I want you to lift that lemon to your mouth and bite into it. Don't think about it. One, two, three, lift, bite. Oh my God, I wish you could see your faces. Open your eyes. I am willing to bet that at least 92% of you experienced your saliva glands producing the necessary enzymes to digest that lemon, but we don't even have any lemons in the room. Why is that? Because what you think about, you bring about. What you ask for, you get. If you act the way you want to be, soon you will be the way that you act. Your mind does not know the difference between fantasy and reality. Have any of you ever had a dream that you were being chased and you woke up sweating and your heart was beating, pounding? Anybody ever had that experience? This is a participatory conversation. Yes? Okay, great. Have any of you ever had the dream that you were going to the bathroom, you woke up and... <laughs> Just me? I'm the only one willing to admit that, right? But your mind doesn't know the difference between fantasy and reality. So what you program through your mental muscles, through your belief, habitually, ultimately becomes your reality. Let's keep going. I don't have a lot of time. Your four competencies. Oh, this is amazing stuff. I stole this from somebody, by the way. This ain't mine, right? I'm the head of the uh, R&D division of my company. Anybody know what R&D is? No, Rob and Duplicate. <laughs> I own my own company, so <laughs> I rob and duplicate. I take good ideas and, and I use them, right? So here's the thing. There are four types of competencies. Whenever you're looking to achieve anything in your life, the first is what we call unconscious incompetency. Unconscious, unconscious incompetency. You don't know what you don't know. Right? You, you, just, you just don't know what you don't know. It hasn't been presented to you yet. But the next level is what we call conscious, uh, conscious incompetency. This means that I know what I don't know. I, um, I started taking flight lessons, flight school, flying a Cessna, right? So I know most of the gauges and stuff in a Cessna now, a little bit. I'm learning. It's a process. I cannot fly an F-14 Tomcat. I am very aware of my conscious incompetency. By the way, Top Gun is coming out, so I'm really excited about that, right? But I'm very aware of that. But next we have what we call conscious competency. Your conscious competency means that you know it, but you have to be conscious in order to do it, right? It's like I have to think about my actions as I'm taking them. This is true in leadership. This is true in business. This is true in your job. Think about that first job where you learned a new system and they taught it to you. First, you didn't know what the system was. Then you knew what the system was, but you were unaware of how it worked. Then they taught you how it worked. So you know it, but you have to think about doing it. Last but not least is what we call unconscious competency when it's second nature, when you're in the zone. If you've ever learned to drive a manual transmission, right, a stick shift, you know, it cut off on you the first few times, right? And then it was jerky. Right. And now, you know, ladies, you're driving a stick shift while eating a croissant on your way to work and doing your makeup at the same time. Right. Unconscious competency. OK, so these are the four levels of competency that you go through in anything. Keep this in mind, because when you get to the level of unconscious competency, it looks like this. Remember that scene in Neo with Neo in the Matrix when he first like got there and realized that he was the one. And Agent Smith came and he's fighting him. And then all of a sudden he's like, uh, uh, mm, mm. you know, light work, as we call it. So let's talk about fear. I think this is important stuff, right? Fear. I am not the person that teaches you to be fearless. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in being fearless. And let me tell you why. Fear is a healthy emotion. When saber toothed tigers, we're coming into our cave, that fear made us fight them or flee to safety and protect our families. Fear was given to us for a reason, right? So I don't believe in being fearless. I believe in being courageous. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is being afraid and doing it anyway. 
I have far more respect for somebody that had a little bit of hesitancy because they were scared, but they went after their dream. If you're fearless, it doesn't mean anything to accomplish it. You would do it anyway. Like, for example, my youngest baby, since she's a Division I athlete, she can't go skydiving right now. But when she graduates high school, she wants to go. I mean, co college, thank you, dear. When she graduates college, she wants to go skydiving. Now, why a human being would jump out of a perfectly good airplane, I have absolutely no idea. It makes no sense to me. But because I'm a girl dad, when she was like, dad, well, mom won't go with me, will you go? And I'm like, sure, babe, I'll go. Why did I do that? So I got to overcome this fear of jumping out of a plane, right? But human beings are only born with two types of fear. This is, this is according to uh, In the Magic of Believing by Claude Bristol, one of my favorite books, The Magic of Believing by Claude Bristol. He teaches us that human beings are only, taught, are only born with two fears, the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. As a baby, those are the only two fears. And I would venture to say that the fear of falling is subjective. Because my youngest daughter, when she was born, we had vaulted ceilings in our home. I used to toss her up, catch her, swing her between my legs. Her mom would come in. She's like, you're going to kill the baby. You're going to kill the baby. I would put her down. She would start crying. And then when her mom left, i pick her up and do the same thing again. Right? But she had no fear of falling. She only had the fear of loud noises. All other types of fear is learned. You either had an experience or somebody told you something and you believe them. Anybody in here in sales or ever been in sales before, right? In sales, we talk about the fear of rejection. You all have heard this before. <laughs> in relationships, we talk about the fear of rejection, right? But the fear of rejection came about because somebody told us that it's a thing. Do five-year-olds have a fear of rejection? For those of you that have children, when they want candy, did they care about rejection? They asked until they got what they wanted. So at what point did we learn that rejection was bad? If it wasn't bad when we were a kid, if it wasn't bad if we're going for what we wanted to when we were kids or going towards when we were kids, why is it bad now? Because it was learned, because it was an experience because somebody told us that, because of who the person was that told us no, right? When I started my own insurance business and I tried to sell something to my mom and she told me no, it wasn't the fact that she told me no, it was who she was to me that impacted me. We have to learn to get over that, right? Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is being afraid and doing it anyway. So be, be courageous in your leadership. Be courageous in your lives. Be courageous in your careers. Take that chance. Guess what? A hundred years from now, we'll all be dead and nobody will know the difference anyway. Right? We spend so much time worried about the thoughts and opinions of other people that really don't matter. If they wouldn't give you a kidney if you needed one, I wouldn't care what they thought. And some of the people that would give me a kidney, I don't care what they think. I'll still take the kidney, though. So change your mind, change your life. Think about this. What are you afraid of? What is it that you're afraid of? What happened to make you afraid of it? Now, if it's an experience, sometimes we can replace that experience with a new experience. We call it replacement therapy. If, you, if, you've, gone, if you've gone through something traumatic, replace that experience with something else. But what is it that made you this way? What are you willing to do to change that? Fears can be faced. Now, I don't mean like crazy, stupid, out of the box, you shouldn't be doing this dumb stuff fear, right? I was scrolling through social media the other day and there was this guy petting a lion's mane through the cage, right? Being daring and courageous and, and you know, lions in the cage. And he turned to take a selfie and the lion got a whole, well, not a selfie, uh, picture and the lion got a hold of his hand. I don't know if he has a hand anymore. Once the lion got a hold of it, I'd like, I was like, I can't look at this anymore. But then I sent it to like 20 people. Um, <laughs> right? So 
This is part of your homework assignment. There is an audio called The Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale. The Strangest Secret. Now, this is an audio that he created for his sales team. I know a lot of you are not in sales, but again, success principles transcend into other areas of your life. So your homework is going to be to listen to this audio. It's free on YouTube. It's also on Apple Music. If you have Apple Music, it's probably on other streaming platforms as well, but it's definitely on YouTube. Now, the last thing that I want you to do is I want you to write down some of your fears and burn them. My better half here, she does something called the burning bowl that she walks her clients through as a life coach, where she has them write down some things that are troubling them, some fears, a whole bunch of different stuff. It's a whole exercise that she does, and they do a burning bowl, and they get rid of it, right? And not that it doesn't still exist, but that physical representation of you seeing the thing that you thought could harm you, because most of the times we worry about things that never come into fruition anyway, unless you continue to worry about them and think about them because now you're pulling them into your existence, but we get rid of them. Don't have a whole lot of time to go into that. Now, let's talk about your success ecosystem. I love this part. Your first part of your success ecosystem is your environment. Your environment inside of you. You may have heard this before. Your biggest enemy, my biggest enemy is my inner me, right? So how do you view yourself and your business? And again, you can exchange this for life. Look at this little kitten looking at himself like a, a, a lion. How do you view yourself? Your self-talk is so important. You talk to yourself more than anybody else. Those little voices inside your head. Some of you are like, what voices? That voice right there. So what I'm talking about. Right. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But your self-talk, why is this so important? Because because you are the person that talks to yourself the most and because you have the closest relationship with yourself than anybody else. Sometimes what ends up happening is what you tell yourself becomes its own self-fulfilling prophecy. And some of you have conversations with yourselves that are so toxic, that are so hindering that are so abusive that if somebody on the street said that to you, you would be willing to fight. Oh, how could I be so stupid? Take, how could I be so stupid? Like it's a different person. You're talking to yourself. Right? I'm so fat. I'm so stupid. I'm so this. I'm so that. And you're telling yourself this. And again, remember what you think about your, about your mind doesn't know the difference between fantasy and reality. Whatever you're telling yourself, the universe is going to say, okay, here you go. More please, yes, because that's what you're telling yourself. So self-esteem, really important. The next part is your actual environment, the people that are around you. Uh, in my book, 31 Amazing Life Lessons of Joshua Stokes, that's one of the books that I wrote. It's a self-help novel about, and I love writing self-help novels because stories make it more palatable and more memorable. But in there, one of the principles I talk about is your reference group. You are the five people that you hang around the most. You're the average of the five people that you hang around the most. This is your reference group, right? So if you hang around five bro pe broke people, you're, go you're gonna be the sixth. You know, if you hang around five smart people, you're gonna elevate yourself. I never knew what this really meant, uh, or I got a living example of it. When I graduated high school, I wanted to go to the Navy to become a fighter pilot, but I graduated at 17 years old and my mom wouldn't sign the paperwork for me. But one of my friends actually went to the Navy. And there was a saying I used to hear when I was younger, you cuss like a sailor. And I never knew what that meant until my friend came back from the Navy. And every other word, <laughs> he was cussing. I was like, you curse like a sailor. I get it now. But it was his reference group. It was the people that he was around on a regular basis. At one point in time, I used to manage a group of aspiring bodybuilders, right? So I was around them all the time. I used to manage their appearances, um, get them their meal preps and all that other stuff because I worked work directly with their coach, right? And so some of the pictures that you've seen here when I was a lot more muscular <laughs> was when I was managing bodybuilders. And it wasn't that I wanted to be one, but I was around them so much and I started working out with them, my workouts completely changed when I got around different people, right? And so that's what happens in life and business and success, right? The closest people to you are your family in a lot of cases, not always, but the closest people are to you and your family. 
I would venture to say that sometimes people tell you things and they mean well, but they don't have your dream or your vision. So they try to keep you from aspiring to what it is that you want to do. When I started as an entrepreneur, I can't tell you how many people told me I needed to get a real job. Oh, you need to get a real job. That little thing you're doing, right? That little business, right? Made over a million dollars in the insurance industry. I was like, what, what little thing I was doing? What? How, how, how little is it, right? You know what I mean? But had I to them, had I bought their opinions because they were the people in my environment, when you buy somebody else's opinion, you buy their lifestyle, right? So if, if you don't want to be where they are, then their opinion doesn't really matter, right? Your reference group, I talked about that. Friends, coworkers, business partners, acquaintances, super important. Are you the person that contributes to the water cooler conversations in a positive way? Or are you around those people that contribute to the water cooler conversations in a negative way? Super important things to look at. Now, a lot of us might be thinking, oh, well, you know, they're just talking. It's just conversation. There are two ways, two ways that you learn things. One is what we call spaced repetition. Spaced repetition. What do I mean by this? How many of you know the words of a song that you do not like? Right? Because you listen to the radio, you heard it over and over again, and now you're singing the words to a song that you don't like because through spaced repetition, you learned it. And now it's on autopilot. It comes on, you're singing it, you don't even realize that you're singing it until you're like, I don't even like this song. But you know all the words. So spaced repetition is one way that we learn. The other way that we learn, and it, we're impacted in a, in a phenomenal way, is what we call a heightened emotional experience. A heightened emotional experience. If something happens to you, good or bad, and you learn a lesson from it because of the experience, or if you attend a conference that has hundreds of people or thousands of people or tens of thousands of people, and there's an arena and there's a collective energy, that heightened emotional experience will have you retain the information a little bit better. Or if you read a good story, a good novel, a good movie or something like that, and you're invested in the characters, then that heightened emotional experience gives you a different experience than somebody just telling you about it, okay? So be careful of the people you're around because those things that they say over and over again, those water cooler conversations that you get involved in sometimes could lead to your demise in, six, in, in life and business, not like physical demise, but you know what I mean, of your career. Your environment. I made this up, by the way, <laughs> right? These are, these are melisms. These are my terms. Your environment, right? Oh, let's go back to this one, too. Social media is super important. Like, it's important in the sense that don't get caught in the scroll hole. That's what we call it, the scroll hole, right? You know, oh, I got a couple of minutes. I'm going to check Instagram. And then an hour later, when you could have been doing something else, you know, you liked all the little kittens, right? You saw, you saw all the people that fell and hurt themselves. You know, all the TikTok popular songs right now, right? So that's important. Uh, your environment, people that have very limited access to you. This is still important too, because there's no real interaction, but you have onlookers and followers. You never know who you are impacting. So important. You never know who you are impacting. So I, I spoke at a conference some years ago, um, probably around 2009. It was about 50 And around 2015, 16, I'd say, I was in Panera Bread getting a, a Mediterranean sandwich and a salad, and somebody tapped me on the shoulder. Now, I'm from 79th and Colfax, so when somebody walks up and taps you, you're like, hold on, man, what's, what's going on, right? And he was like, thank you. Puzzled? For what, <laughs> right? What happened? He was like, I saw you at that conference back in 2009. I was in a really tough place. And the words that you said that day changed my life, changed my attitude, changed my thought process. And I'm like, wow. I'm like, which conference was it? Like I spoke at a few conferences and we, I was like, do you mind if we eat together? And I sat down with the young man, his name's Jeremy. We sat down and we talked for about an hour and a half. 
And he was just telling me all the stuff, all the things that he learned and that he's been doing based off of one conversation. We call this the ripple effect. If you throw a, a pebble in a pond, the initial impact is there, but where it goes from there, you never know. Doing extremely well now, runs his own business, has, has a wife and three kids, just all these things. But at that time in 2009, when it, when it initially happened, like, I, mean, I don't want to tell his business, but he wasn't in a good place. He wasn't in a good headspace, right? So be careful about what you're presenting to other people. And I got to be careful of my time. We got some stuff. So let's talk about that mental muscle sickness. Oh, this is the stuff right here. Some people suffer from PMS, a poverty mentality syndrome. Poverty mentality syndrome. What do I mean by that? Now, I know the people in the room, you know, upper middle class, upper class, whatever, whatever your social status is, whatever your financial status is, I'm talking to a group of winners here. So you might be thinking, well, that doesn't apply to me. Well, let's think about it like this. Do you operate from an abundance mentality? Meaning that there's enough resources, money, jobs, whatever, available for everybody. If not, you suffer from the poverty mentality syndrome. So I'm in the acting world. I, I play a, a homicide detective on Chicago PD from time to time. I've been on The Shy, I've been on Empire, I've been on a, a bunch of shows, We've got movies on Netflix, Amazon, all of this stuff. I'm in a play going up at ETA Theater here on the South Side in August. Um, but when auditions happen, there's a group of us, if we got, because we know we're, we're like kind of the same type of actor, even if the other agents didn't put them in for the audition, I'll call my friend and say, hey, bro, there's an audition taking place, right? This is my call time. Just show up and put your name on the sheet. They'll look at you, right? You got your SAG card. They'll look at you. Now, hopefully, no casting directors will ever see this video and know that we do this. Let's cut this part out of the video, please, okay? But in some cases, when I've been the person that was called to show up, even though my agent didn't get me the audition, I ended up booking the show because my friend didn't have the poverty mentality thinking that, you know what, if I invite him, I, I won't get it. Now, my friend invited me and I got that particular role, he ended up getting a bigger role on the show. Now, had I not come and they picked him, he would have never gotten that role, the bigger role, right? I was like, why didn't you call me for that audition? He was like, well, you already got this role, right? <laughs> Only the lucky can do well in life or business, right? And I believe that. I believe that you have to be lucky. Because luck stands for laboring under correct knowledge. The harder I work, the luckier I get. The more prepared I am, the luckier I get. When my friend called me about coming to do this conference, it was because I was laboring under correct knowledge for a period of time to put myself in the position to be able to be here with you all today. It also helped that I'm alumni. But still, right, there are other alumni that aren't speaking at this conference this, this week, right? but you have to labor under correct knowledge. Some people have a terminal case of permanent potential. Are you living out of your passion or living out of your potential for your passion? There's a difference. Some of you all go on vacation on a regular basis to a place called Someday Isle. Someday I'll go after the promotion. Someday I'll start this business. Someday I'll make myself available to be in a loving relationship. Not Gilligan's Isle, Someday I'll, right? Some people are all potential with no action. If you know how to drive an Indianapolis 500 race car and you have one in your, your garage, if you don't put it on the track, you'll never win a race. There's a failure phobia. We talked a little bit about that. But we use failure, failure as fertilizer for success. Nelson Mandela was quoted as saying, I never lose. I either win or I learn. So how do you look at failure? 
Did you know that the reason Formula 409 is called Formula 409 is because the first 408 ways were not successful? That's where Formula 409 came from. Edison found thousands of ways that the light bulb wouldn't work until he found the way that would. Thank you. We're not doing this by candlelight, right? All right, let's build your mental immune system. How do we do that? Again, this tightrope walker, we want you to focus on the goal. Obstacles are what you see when you take your eyes off of your goal. You got to learn to distract your distractions. When you present yourself with a possibility, anything that's not that possibility will pop up to deter you from it. So turn your excuses into reasons. Your excuse why you don't do something should be the reason why you do. I don't have the money. Well, how long do you want that to be the case? Don't let that be your excuse. Let that be the reason why you do whatever, start the business, get the new job, go for the promotion, right? And in a lot of cases, all you need is an example. All you need is an, is an example of somebody else who did it, or if, they, if there is no example, then you become the person that is the example. Y'all too quiet this morning. Reposition your thoughts about failure. Failure is fun, right? I look at my failures, they're so much fun because I learn from them. They help me become better at what I do. Trust me, my first presentation was nothing like this, right? I wasn't eager to get out and be in the crowd. I was behind the podium and they probably still have nail marks to this day <laughs> for me standing there, you know, with this written speech that I read and barely looked up. It wasn't all of this. Create a success routine. Remember, we talked about habits. People form habits and habits form futures. People form habits and habits form futures. I had a habit of eating French fries and butter pecan ice cream, not at the same time, but in succession over COVID. That was my comfort food, right? French fries in the air fryer, so it wasn't as bad. You know, air fryer French fries, so it wasn't greasy. Any type of French fry. I am a French fry connoisseur right? And butter pecan ice cream. So I would eat those things. And then that habit, <laughs> maybe turn uh, the six pack into a 40 ounce, <laughs> right? I got a little pony keg going, right? But I'm slimming down now, you know, a little bit. But it was the habit, right? So success as a routine or a habit that programming that we're talking about, what are you reading? What are you listening to? Are you attending conferences and seminars like this? Are you taking classes? What professional development are you involved in? What personal development are you involved in? What does your success routine look like? It's important. All right, set goals and create targets to hit along the way. That should be with an S, I need to change that. Uh, set goals. Would you make a note for that, babe, please? I hate typos. <sighs> but set goals and benchmarks along the way, right? Celebrate the little wins. When I set a big goal for myself, I celebrate at every single benchmark. And I set smaller goals along the way because that helps me build the confidence that I need to get to the bigger goal. If you want to climb a mountain, there are benchmarks along the way that you can be like, man, let me make it to this area and get some rest. This is good. You know, I'm a quarter of the way. I'm half of the way. I'm three quarters of the way, as opposed to looking at this mountain like, how the hell am I going to do this? Constantly check your attitude. Zig Ziglar said, it is your attitude, not your aptitude, that determines your altitude. This is important stuff. All right, best motivators. Strong reason why. We started out talking about this at the beginning. Strong reason why. Help you with anything. A noble cause. Do you really believe in what you're doing? Are you here to make an impact in the world? 
What is your personal mission statement? I know the school has a mission statement. Your job has a mission statement. We talk about vision, value, goals, all of that stuff, right? But what is your personal mission statement? What is the mission statement for your life? Do you have one? If not, create one. A desire for excellence. So anybody in here, a Throner, Game of Thrones fan? We got some Throners in here. I was completely, completely into Game of Thrones. Like, you know, I used to read all the, the, the threads and the separate articles and watch the at behind the scenes and all of that other stuff. So much so that I think around season three or four of Game of Thrones, I had a family crest made for the Roberson family. Right? And, and, and House Roberson has a motto, just like the Starks are, Winter is coming, right? <laughs> a Lannister always pays their debts, right? All of these things. So Roberson is done with excellence. That's our house motto, done with excellence. Got a whole crest behind it, right? So a desire for excellence, wanting to be the best you that you can be and put your best foot forward. Autonomy, for, some, for many of us, that's important. So when I got out of college, I became a drug dealer. Legally, I went into pharmaceutical sales. Come on, guys. <laughs> I did say I was from 79th and Colfax, didn't I? Yeah. So I was in pharmaceutical sales, and I got fired from that job. And it was at that time that I decided I never wanted a man or woman telling me how much I was worth, when I could take time off, you know, the ability to fire me and control my financial. Never wanted that, right? So autonomy was important for me. Now, I'm not trying to take people away from their jobs and whatever it is that you're doing, because that's important. We, we need people to do what they were designed to do. But for me, I think this career path and my ability to impact other people is the most important thing for me. And then legacy. What is legacy? Now, I used to think that legacy meant that I need to keep trying until I get a son. That's what I used to think, because I have two daughters and actually lost a son uh, some years ago, right? So... I used to think that my legacy was only going to be determined by my family name, but in all actuality, legacy is only how people remember you and the impact that you've made on the world. Legacy, I mean, yeah, it could be through your children. There are people that have no kids at all. Mother Teresa, amazing legacy. All right, folks, last slide. Write out your goals in first person every morning. General business, health, total income, family. Write three things you are grateful for and three wins from your previous day. This is your homework. This is your homework. I told you Mr. Roberson was going to give you homework. So you want to write your goals in first person as if you have already achieved them. It does something different in your mind when you write them like you already have it. Not I will, but I have, I am. I, whatever, in first person, like you've already achieved them, right? So general business, health, total income, family, three things you're grateful for every day. We want to start off with gratitude and three wins from the previous day. And they don't have to be huge, gigantic wins, right? When I was going through depression and anxiety, one of my wins was I took a shower yesterday. I was big. I'm not going to act like mental health isn't important. That was a win for me. I took a shower. I actually ate today. Right? So three wins from the previous day, wherever you are. All right? Write out expli an explicitly detailed statement of exactly how you want your life and business to look in a year. Right? So this is important. You're writing them out in first person. This is overall. This is general. But a year from now, so that we could start to work on the benchmarks of where you want your life to be in a year. Last but not least, listen to The Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale every day for the length of this, well, I'm not teaching a course right now, but he says 30 days in the audio. Listen to it every day. It's 30 minutes. Do it while you shower, shave, shampoo, whatever you do in the morning on your way to work. Listen to that, okay? And if you want to connect with me, have any questions, comments, concerns, gripes, or belly aches, by the way, the thoughts and opinions of Mel Roberson do not necessarily represent those of Roosevelt University and any parties that... <laughs> Right, that's the disclaimer in case I said anything I wasn't supposed to. Um, but yeah, you can connect with me there. I have a, a, an email list you can get on. Oh, as my gift to you, because I didn't have enough time to do it today. 
on, on this site, there's a free 15 minute goal setting workshop, goal achieving workshop. It's called Goal Getters. It's free, it's on there. Just click on there and listen to it and take copious notes uh, because it, it's seven steps to successful goal setting. If I've done nothing else, and I didn't even really get into the backstory of my life, I grew up in the inner city of Chicago. I got shot outside my own house my senior year in high school. Like the person that you see standing before you now is not who I was many, many years ago, right? And if I've done nothing else, I figured out a way how to set a goal and achieve it, no matter how big or small it is. Now, my bigger ones, some of those I'm still working on, right? But it makes sense. So melroberson.com, all my social media is on there. The goal setting workshop is on there. You can get to my books from there. Anything you want, anything you need from me is absolutely on there. I think it's time for Q&A. Is that what we do now? Please give them a round of applause. Anyone have any questions for Mel? You have a question? I have a comment, if that's okay. Mel, thanks for an energizing opening presentation today. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, I just wanted, I don't have a question. I just want to compliment you on um, the success ecosystem. I love that concept. You know, being ambitious is great but you can't just sort of charge ahead and go after something without paying attention to mm -hmm. the environment as you taught us, the environment and the environment. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Hi, Jennifer. Well, hello again. I had a comment that I wanted to share just kind of on the power of writing out your goals. Um, I did that as part of an actual homework assignment and, you know, wrote out personal goals, um, you know, down to how many kids I wanted to have or not have. And then I stuck it in a drawer and found it 10 years later. And I had accomplished every single goal down to within months of when I said I was going to do that. So it's really powerful to have an intentional plan. And of course, I thought I just did it for homework. So it turned out to be more. I really support that. And agree. This has just been a great way to start off the conference. Thank you. Thank you. You know, in the goal setting, in the goal setting seminar, um, the first principle is think it and ink it. Something different have, and, and when you personally write it out, I don't mean type it out, put it in your phone, handwritten, there's a synapse that happens in your brain when you're actually physically writing out your, your goals. And so I'm not going to give you a, give away the seminar. You can listen to it. It's, it's on the site. But that's an, a really important part. There was a study or a, 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 an experiment that was done with a graduating class of Harvard Business School and the comparison of those who wrote their goals out in comparison to those that didn't, vastly different. And that's in the seminar you can listen to, it's free. Any more questions? Mel, I, I, you have a question? And then I have a question for Mel too. Sure. So I'm an avid reader, but I'm also a commuter. So do you have any podcasts that you recommend? Any speakers to listen to? Because I'm in the car 40 minutes in the morning and 40 minutes at night, and I need some new content to fill my mind with. Um, I haven't been a big podcast listener to her uh, as much as I am a seminar guy, right? There, there are certain seminars and YouTube audios and people that I listen to. I'm really big on Jim Rohn. Jim Rohn is one of my favorites, even though he's no longer with us. He has some amazing stuff. Uh, his, the Challenge to Succeed by Jim Rohn is one of my favorites. There's a guy named Bob Moad out of Tacoma, Washington, and he has one called um, Increasing Human Effectiveness. That's, that's one of the ones, and it's old. Like One of my professors gave it to me while I was in college in the 90s, but it's still so relevant. Uh, I listened to, oh, Darren Hardy has a podcast. Yes, I do listen to Darren Hardy. He has a book also called The Compound Effect. Darren Hardy is amazing. Um, and you know what? My Instagram is on, is on my, and my Facebook is on there, but hit, hit my inbox and IG and I'll give you links to a lot of different audios you can listen to. Do we have any more questions? Are you I'm, all awake? Yeah, right? I'm gonna jump in here, Mel. So I have a question. You, know, you talked a, a lot this morning about it, a lot of different things, but I didn't hear anything about any mentors. Can you talk about the importance of mentors and any mentors you had? So in life, there are mentors and there are mistakes. Uh-oh. Mentors hurt a lot less, right? 
So I, I've had many mentors and still have mentors. In any area of my life where I want to succeed, I get a coach or a mentor. You know, uh, any professional ball player has a coach and a trainer to teach them how to be the best at what they do. So um, one of my part-time hobbies is I'm a chef. And I have celebrity chef mentors who, once I started cooking and learning from them, oh my God, it's a vast difference. Even in the plating of my food now. So much so that I'm thinking about going to get another degree in culinary. But it's crazy. But in, in business, so, so people say, well, how do I find a mentor? There are two ways to find a mentor, right? And, or a sponsor in some cases, depending on your job or, or, or field of business. But I had mentors that didn't even know they were my mentors, like Jim Rohn, like Zig Ziglar, like uh, Russ Whitney, Frank McKinney, Tony Robbins, because I could listen to them over and over again and get the advice that I needed through their recordings. But also I've had mentors in business. Uh, one of my personal mentors is a gentleman by the name of Darnell Self. He's a two-time um, Black Chamber of Commerce Entrepreneur of the Year. I had another mentor who's deceased by the name of Wilburn Smith, who taught me a lot of stuff in the, in the insurance industry. I've studied under Les Brown when I first started my speaking career. I studied under Les Brown, and I still take speaking courses. I've been through Toastmasters. I don't know if anybody has taken Toastmasters. If you were counting my ums today, please let me know how I did, fellow Toastmasters. I don't think I did any. I'm very conscious of that. So I always find a mentor in the area that I want to learn or be suitably proficient in because it helps accelerate my learning curve and gets me to my goal a lot faster. One more time, any more questions for Mel before he takes off? Well, Mel, I wanna thank you so much for this wonderful presentation to us. And I wanna thank our amazing audience for being here today. I was so impressed with everything. I took notes, I have note cards. Thank I'm you. gonna do some studying tonight. Absolutely. The best thing that I heard today for me was the poverty mentality syndrome mm -hmm. in TV? You know, uh, uh, there may be just a few positions open, and so I want to work on my poverty mentality syndrome. Absolutely, that's a big one for me. Absolutely, got a lot of takeaways. I can't thank you enough. Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Please connect with me on socials, and you know, anything that's available on my website. You know, feel free to check it out. And uh, if anybody ever needs me for anything, I love doing stuff like this. We do professional development seminars on, another, uh, on, a, on a regular basis. So if you have somebody you wanna link us with, if, if somebody needs to make that mental shift uh, so that they could achieve their greatness, we are readily available. And um, that's my time. Thank that's you. That's what I was gonna say. You can visit him on LinkedIn and check out his books and follow him on the at Total Gent. And thank you again. And don't forget to share your inspirations, insights, and photos through social with the hashtag Lake, Laker Leadership Conference. Thank you. Thank you so much. So up next, our first break in program session set A that will feature discussions on navigating social media channels. The generosity of giving panel saying yes to becoming an entrepreneur panel and as we break away from this big group session stop by the employer expo and then make your way to wabash floor 10 where all the program sessions will be located check the sign off at the elevator to see which room number your session will be located in and we'll see you there <laughs>